Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Young Scientific Roundtable. We will start in a sh few short minutes, but do use the chat box to introduce yourself. I see some of you have already started. And uh, so before we join, you should be now seeing in your screen a poll question about where you're coming from. Please answer it as we really want to get to know you better. In the meantime, I will leave you with a short video about the World Food Forum journey and how we got from last year beginning and inception of the forum until now. So I hope you enjoy the video. We are so committed to put together the truly youth-led platform to transform our food system. And for me, and I guess for everyone else here, this is a clear indication that to build better food systems, young people must be leading the way. We still have time and energy to bring about change for the better, for better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life, and why not, for a better future. A future in which the rest of the world focuses on eliminating barriers such as finance, land, and information that prevent young people from meaningfully engaging different components of food system. And a future in which you and me and those who will come after us will inherit food systems that are better for the health, for the health of people, animals, plants, and the planet. Hello everyone once again, and I hope you like this short video about the World Food Forum. For those of you who don't know, the World Food Forum is a youth-led movement founded by the Youth Committee of FAO and a network of partners who are working together for the achievement of the sustainable development goals, especially zero hunger. For those of you who just joined, you should now be seeing on your screen a poll uh, regarding where you're joining from. So please answer it because we really want to get to know you better. I want to welcome you to the annual World Food Forum Young Scientific Roundtable organized by the TRC team. That is the Transformative Research Challenge team. I am extremely happy and honored to be hosting this important event today and welcome such a broad audience coming from all around the world. Speaking of which, Michelle, why don't you show us the results from the poll question? Wow, oh my God, I see we have really all regions almost all regions represented. Maybe uh, we still have some uh, individuals from the Near East who are going to be joining, or maybe didn't get to answer the poll. If there is anyone from the Near East, please uh, write it on the chat. 
We have lots of folks from Latin America, Europe, uh, Asia and the Pacific, North America. So, wow, Africa, super exciting. Thank you so much for joining. Your interest and presence here today prove the crucial and active role that youth is playing in the current challenges that the world is facing today. And also the potential that youth, and let me include myself in that group, that we have to transform our agri-food systems and end hunger. So before we start, let me quickly introduce myself. Connected from Bogota, Colombia, my name is Carolina Pulidariza, and I am the co-lead of the World Food Forum Innovation Track, together with Nina, who is here with us today. I will be your moderator today, leading you jointly with our World Food Forum team on what we hope will be a different event, because let's face it, we are all a bit tired of Zoom and webinars. Today is all going to be about participation, so please keep the questions coming. I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners for this meeting, FAO, CGIR, and A5 Alliance, for helping us gather a useful and brilliant panel of researchers that throughout this hour session will illustrate how they are transforming our agri-food systems through their research. Besides having an inspiring discussion among these bright young researchers, we will also launch the TRC Transformative Research Challenge today. So we want to give you a head start. Basically, this challenge is going to launch next week, but we want you to have that extra week to start working on your concept notes and share your idea, your innovative idea to transform our agri-food systems through science. You will have until June 6 to share your two page concept note. And I think the team here will share in the chat below um, the link where you can send it to us. So use this week wisely so you can be one of the finalists of this year's TRC. Now let's quickly go through the agenda today. And we are extremely honored to have special messages from FAO chief economist as well as uh, the FAO chief scientist. So first we'll start with the chief economist opening remarks. He was going to join, but had a last minute commitment. He did send his video remarks that we will be sharing in a minute. Uh, we will also have the five young scientists from CGR, IR and A5 introduce themselves and go over the research after this. And this will be followed by a very active discussion with all of the panelists and we will be asking them your questions. So make sure you keep them coming. And last but not least, we will have the concluding remarks by FAO Chief Scientist Ismahan Eluafi. But yeah, without further ado, let's quickly jump in to Maximo Torero's remarks. I am very grateful for the opportunity to be with all of you here today, as this event represents the intersection of my experience and passions. The empowerment of youth in science and the transformation of our agri-food systems to achieve sustainable development goals, in particularly zero hunger, reduction of inequality, and reduction of poverty. The deep belief that science is a key driver of sustainable development has guided my career to senior scientific and leadership positions in different countries and international organizations. Today, as FAO Chief Economist and the Chair of the FAO Youth Committee, one of my main priorities is the World Food Forum to serve as a global knowledge and innovation center fostering and inspiring youth-led solutions and innovations on technology and science to be able to reduce the bottlenecks that we are facing today. This is why I am very excited to welcome you all to the pre-launch event of the one and only research competition of the WFF, the Transformative Research Challenge. I am also very happy to announce that I will be again one of the judges of this year's competition and cannot wait to dive into your innovative science-based solutions to transform our agri-food systems. The challenges today are higher than ever. The fact that you are here today shows me that you recognize the importance of the SDGs and their role in achieving a better and more sustainable future for all. However, as we enter the final years to reach these goals, the decade of much needed action, we are far behind where we need to be. A deficit made more severe by the COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing conflicts which have resulted in an increase in hunger under the nourishment and increasing extreme poverty and moving us farther away from our SDGs. There are currently over 2 billion people who lack access to adequate food, which is more than the entire population of Africa and the Americas combined. This number, number is rapidly growing due to conflicts as well as pest, climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic, which severely impacted the food security and livelihoods of much of the world, in particularly those who were already most vulnerable, including women and children. And while hunger is on the rise, an estimated 
one third of all produced globally is lost or goes to waste, it is important to understand that this is unacceptable. We cannot afford with the levels of chronic undernourishment and lack access to healthy diets to have this amount of food being lost or waste. We must remember that food is precious. It's a human right. Without it, there is, there is not going to be health. And minimizing food loss and also food waste is critical, especially as the new war in Ukraine is pushing more people into hunger. Escalating conflict in Ukraine is even exacerbating more the pain that we were already suffering because of COVID-19. Russian Federation and Ukraine are one third of the cereal exports in the world. Not only that, Russian Federation represents 63% of the exports of sunflower, which is central for oil, for oil seeds. And at the same time, Russian Federation is a key exporter of fertilizers, the first in nitrogen, the second in, in potassium, and the third in, 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 in potassium. So just last month, as a result of this, the global food price jumped to the highest level so ever. FAO food price index averaged 159.3 points, which is, was 12.6% higher than it was in February and 33.6 higher than in March 2021. This is the highest ever since the creation of the food price index of FAO index in terms of prices. We are in real and normally nominal terms higher than before 2007, 2008, and 2011 food crises. While the current situation is dire and alarming, global awareness of and focus on these issues is not yet at the levels that needed to incite action and sustainable change. If we are going to have a world free from hunger, and malnutrition, we need all hands on the deck. And I see youth playing an essential role in making this happen, especially because it is youth and the generation to come who will inherit the world. To address the unprecedented challenge facing our global food agri-food systems, we need to find actionable research-based solutions, and we must engage and empower youth and harness their potential to become catalysts for positive change. We need to invest in inclusive culture of innovation and evidence-based problem solving to provide sustainable solutions at the scale. The participation of young women and men in science is vital to spark the creativity and new thinking to develop the inclusive and accessible tools and systems to achieve the SDGs. And I am encouraged by what I am seeing, young researchers and inspired ones from around the world eager to contribute to the creation of better food future. It's time to move to action, but it's time to move to action with science-based information. We need to release constraints. We need to increase efficiencies by reducing food loss and waste, by using better our fertilizers, by finding solutions to the challenges we are facing today so that we can become a world more resilient to this type of shocks. Last year, the TRC surprised and delighted us with innovative research projects led by youth around the categories of better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life the core pillars of our strategic framework at FAO. For instance, we saw an innovative solutions for Malaysia entitled PreBioTech, scaling alternative protein with prebiotics, which emphasize the use of palm oil byproducts and black soldier fly farming for a meat feed, for animal feed. Also, we were presented with insights on how to eradicate pests, this pet is round ruminants and improve the livelihood of smallholder farmers in developing countries with concrete evidence from Senegal. Last but not least, we awarded the first place to Nahama Abdar, a bright young woman who together with her team invited us to understand how behavioral change in irrigation practice can result from the adoption of water serving technologies with a case study from one of the most water scarce countries in the world, Jordan. Dr. Amdar is there with us today, and I am eager to hear more about her findings and what she was able to accomplish. I honestly can't wait to see the innovations that you will bring to the table this year. In 2022, the World Food Forum will rally around the theme of healthy diets, healthy planet. For this, we'll give a special TRC prize to the team that aligns best to this subject. So researchers on the environment and nutrition and especially are especially encouraged this year to apply because there are significant challenges we need to resolve. So if you are a young or youthful researcher or team of up to five researchers who is committed to the achievement of the SDGs through science-based solutions, here is your chance to make the difference. Apply to the WFF Transforming Research Challenge, an international open call for research and aspiring researchers who want to create better food future. The procedure is very simple. 
all you have to do is submit your two-page concept note by June 1st of this year. The WFF team will be sharing all the details now in the chat box with a relevant link. I very much look forward to seeing your innovative research ideas at the WFF stage in October 2022. To conclude, let me stress once again how encouraged I am to see so many of you join together here today to create a science-based passionate dialogue and together find a solutions that we need to create a better and more sustainable food for future for all. I hope to work with many of you to transform our, our agri-food systems through better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind. So let's work together, let's bring innovation, let's bring science, and let's change and transform the agri-food systems of today. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Mr. Torero, for this inspiring message and also for the tips that you shared for this year's Transformative Research Challenge. I hope you listened that we are going to have a special prize for research around environment and nutrition. So please go ahead and start thinking about your innovative idea. And now let's move on to the second part of this event. Uh, that is the core of the event. So the presentation of our researchers that you're seeing on the screen. And for this, we partnered with two organizations, CGIR and A5. And let's start with the research researchers from CGIR. So for those of you who don't know, CGIR is a global research partnership for a food secure future dedicated to reducing poverty, enhancing food and nutrition security, and improving natural resources and ecosystem services. It, its research is carried out in 12 CGIR centers and in close collaboration with hundreds of partners. So I forgot to say that each of these uh, researchers were selected in line with FAO's for better, as Mr. Toledo said, and um, they are going to go very quickly through their research and how it aligns to each of the FAO's for better, which are better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. So first, I am happy and honored to introduce Nathan Amadar, who is also the young researcher who won the very first TRC last year. Nathan works for the International Water Management Institute as a research officer on water resources management and water accounting. She holds a water resource engineering degree from AI Bath University in Syria, a master's degree in environmental sciences and management from the Hashmi University in Britain, and she's currently undertaking her PhD in water resource management. I feel you, Nathan, I'm also trying to finalize my PhD. <laughs> so over to you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet this group of vital uh, people coming to join us in this uh, round table. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Nafan Amadar. Uh, I work at the International Water Management Institute as a research officer. And I was also the winner of the uh, World Food Forum a Transformative Research Award for the last year. As part of the World Food Forum and of the scientific community um, worldwide, I'm committed to support the 23, uh, achieving the 2030 agenda. And uh, I'm committed to contribute through my research to transforming our agri for, uh, food systems for the four betters, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life. Uh, because water is the major input for food production and it's prerequisite for uh, achieving food security, I focus in my research on, on, on water, uh, mainly on the topic of water availability. You know, I belong to, the, to one of the most water scarce countries in, in, in the world. Uh, Jordan. So I focus in my research on improving water availability for food production. In this region of the world, we face multiple challenges to water availability. And we can classify these challenges as climate-driven challenges and the human-driven challenges. While we, 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 we can't control the climate-driven challenges, we have full control of the human-driven challenges. And this means that if we change the way we deal with water at every level, we would be able to improve the state of, of water resources in this country and in, in any water scarce country. Last year, I focused in my research on understanding the change in farmers' irrigation behavior in the highlands of Jordan. My research findings suggest that 
if you if farm if farmers change their irrigation practices alone without any technology they would be able to to save up to 50 percent of what the technology alone could help them save and this can be achieved by providing farmers with information simple information that tells them when and how much to irrigate this also has economic benefits to farmers in return. For example, improving farmers' water use behavior could bring them uh, benefits related to improving the, the, their water productivity. And this means uh, producing uh, the same amount of, of uh, crop with less water, with less energy. And this ultimately improves their agribusiness sustainability and reduce their human footprint on the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rafa. <laughs> Thank you. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. And I really loved how you said that there are things we really can't control. And those are the ones we keep hearing, like war and climate change. But we do have full control on how we use our resources like water. So thank you for those insights. Thank you. As I was mentioning, for this event, we also joined forces with A5 Alliance. An A5 Alliance was born from the need to find solutions to global challenges such as climate change, food security, inclusive economic growth, and political stability. To this end, five top-ranked universities in the domain of agriculture and food and sustainability joined forces to create this alliance. The members are China Agricultural University, Cornell University, University of California Davis, University of Sao Paulo, and our partners since the very beginning of this challenge, uh, Wageningen University and Research. So last year we had uh, members from California Davis as well as from China Agricultural University. And this year we brought the other universities along. So first, I would like to introduce Paige Kelly from Cornell University. Paige has strong connection to the Rural Sociological Society having served on their council as research interest group chair and on multiple committees. She received her bachelor in agronomy and community and environmental sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and master's and PhD in rural sociology in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at the Ohio State University. She has been selected for her link to the better life component of FAO's strategic framework. So now Paige, I'm happy to hand you the floor. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. So my name is Paige Kelly, and I'm a postdoctoral associate at, in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University in the United States. And the Department of Global Development is a community of scholars and practitioners geared towards three signature strengths, environmental sustainability, food and nutritional security, and well-being and inclusion. So a little bit about my research. I am trained as a rural sociologist and my research fits predominantly in the last strength of my Department of Global Development, which is well-being and inclusion. And this area emphasizes studying the causes, manifestations and consequences of poverty and inequality in the global political economy and the histories and legacies of development projects and alternative models that promote well-being. So the key motivation of my research is understanding why poverty and inequality vary so distinctly across places. And I focus on the importance of institutional arrangements, specifically subnational governments, and their available resources and policies as causes of inequality across communities. So, for example, in the United States, Residents' experiences of government and access to government programs and supports, such as health insurance, food assistance, unemployment assurance, and educational opportunities, are highly contingent upon the state and region in which they live. This is also the case in global contexts where rural, urban, rich, and poor countries experience different life chances and access to opportunities based on where they live. So how does this all relate to the theme of better life? So first, it highlights how government's resources and policies hold the potential to both perpetuate and abate unequal access to economic opportunities and inclusive prosperity. It also, and as such, it recognizes how governments are essential to understanding why, for some populations, a better life, including nutritional and adequate food supplies, are not yet accessible. 
And secondly, and I would argue more importantly, it also allows for empirically examining mechanisms or the ways in which governments and non-governmental policies could be better leveraged to reduce inequalities across rural and urban areas, rich and poor countries, as well as among marginalized populations, such as for women and racialized minority populations. So ultimately understanding um, the possible solutions to poverty and inequality is the first step, I would argue, to enabling a better life and a better food system that allows for nutritional food for all people, regardless of where they live or their social identities. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Paige. It's really fascinating. And uh, it really, I think, touches most of the world, rich and poor countries alike. Uh, uh, the access to adequate and nutritious food is key. Uh, and it is very needed, especially if you want to uh, deal with without food, there can be no help. So it is actually at the base. Um, now, uh, I would like to pass the floor to another researcher joining us all the way from the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, his name is Bruno da Silva Cerosi, and he's an assistant professor of aquaculture in the College of Agriculture at the same university. He holds a bachelor's in agronomy and a master's in animal science, both received from the same university. In 2016, he earned his PhD in soil, water, and environmental science from the University of Arizona in the United States. Uh, Bruno, I now give you the floor to tell us more about the better production aspect of FAO's uh, strategic framework. Thank you for your kind introduction, Carolina. Can you hear me well? Okay, Perfect. excellent. Um, so I'd like to start by asking you all this you know, think about the way our ancestors used to grow food. Animals were an integral part of cropping systems. We used them to power farm machinery, provide food and fiber, and fertilize the fields. And this model of agriculture lasted for thousands of years. But since the advent of the Industrial Revolution and intensive farming practices, we've witnessed a gradual divorce between animal and plant production. And along with bountiful farms and meaty chicken breasts that feed today a 9 billion population, it came the heavy reliance on synthetic fertilizers and a huge energy demand. This intensive agricultural model seemed to be working fine. Then all it took was a pandemic and a war to disrupt and expose the flaws of this linear economy. It's time to go circular. And there are several ways we can transition to a more circular economy. In terms of better production, there's a tremendous opportunity, I think, to reintegrate animal and plant production, just like we used to do in, in the 1800s. I'm not saying we should though go back to that way of farming, but at least we can incorporate the mindset of circularity that our grandfathers used to have but there are multiple combinations of animal and plant species available. I decided to focus on one specific combination of fish and vegetables, widely known as aquaponics. But aquaponics, not just a matter of putting fish and plants together and just hoping for that to work. We must understand the dynamics of the flows of water and nutrients through these highly complex systems so that we're able to balance inputs and outputs. And once we know all this, we put it into a mathematical model and simulate an infinite number of scenarios involving, uh, for example, uh, different numbers of fish and plants growing in this system. This speeds up the process of discovery since we don't need to test too many fish plant configurations in the real world that would eventually result in failure we only go for the ones with a higher likelihood of success. This tool could be used too by farmers to predict with quite accuracy what elements would be lacking or exceeding the demand or ideal crop development. Then take preemptive actions 
and save resources. But in the end of the day, I just hope that my research efforts just contribute to bringing more and more nutritious food to the plate of many at affordable prices with negligible environmental impact. I think it is possible. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. Thank you, Bruno. And that is the energy we need in young researchers such as yourself. That is Excellent. really the, no, it's, it's really inspiring what you just said. And thank you for that invitation to those circular because we saw linear is not the way to go when it comes to food production. So thank you very much. And now let me pass the floor, last but not least, to Marie. Marie is a postdoctoral researcher at the Soil Biology Group of Wageningen University. She obtained her master's in soil science and a PhD in plant ecology from Cornell University. Her research focuses on plant-soil interactions in both neutral and agricultural ecosystems. So Marie is going to talk to us about the link of her research to the better environment um, uh, aspect from Ethel's uh, strategic framework. And now, uh, happy to hear you, Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carolina. I'm very happy to be here today to join the discussion on how to transform our food systems and to present uh, how my research contributes to a better environment. So I'm a plant and soil ecologist, and broadly speaking, I work on the question of how we can incorporate plant diversity into agricultural systems to protect soil resources, promote more efficient use of nutrients, and overall support a better environment. And I approach this question from a below ground perspective. So I'm very fascinated by what is happening below ground beneath our feet and very driven to unravel what this complexity of interaction taking place between plants and the soil mean and what we can learn from it. So if we look at natural ecosystems, we see that plants have very diverse root systems and have developed a wide range of strategies to acquire nutrients from the soil and to protect themselves against diseases and pests. But yet, if we then look at agricultural systems, we see that nowadays they're mainly dominated by monocultures with root systems um, that heavily rely on high nutrient fertilizer inputs and other agrochemicals. So in my research, I explore how agriculture can take advantage of the diverse below ground abilities of plants found in nature to recycle nutrients and support soil health. So to give a concrete example, in my current research, I investigate plant species variation in root exudate profiles and what this means for the recycling of soil resources. So root exudates are very small compounds released by plant roots. And these compounds can mobilize nutrients from soil minerals, as well as stimulate microorganisms to recycle organic matter and thereby also provide nutrients to plants. And this may not only benefit the plant that's releasing these compounds, but potentially also neighboring plants. And this is quite an exciting prospect, as this could result in the selection of plant species combinations that below ground facilitate each other's growth and nutrient acquisitions. And so there are already examples of such combinations, for example, intercropping with grain and legume crops. Um, those systems are already based on such principles but there may be other combinations or designs out there to explore. And so understanding this, so which root exudate compounds, which plant species and which combination of plants can promote efficient nutrient use will yield us a small piece of the puzzle in designing efficient, resilient and sustainable agri-food systems that support a better environment. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Marie. That was incredibly inspiring. And I would love to, to hear more in the question and answer se session about these examples of existing methods that are out there. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for all of your presentation. And I guess we have now reached the third part of the event, which is the panel discussion between uh, you who are connected out there. So please keep the question coming and this panel of young researchers. So while we start receiving the questions on the chat box, so please click on the Q&A option of Zoom, we're going to start with a few of the questions that we have prepared for the panel. And let's start with the first question for Nafan. Uh, so Nafan, we would like to 
Of course, your research is fascinating. I would love to hear more about everything about behavioral change and water saving practices, but we are a bit biased. I want you to tell us what it meant to you as a young researcher, woman researcher, to win the TRC last year. Yeah, I think uh, I think everyone now saw my reaction at that precious moment. You know, I was I, <laughs> I reacted like a kid who, who 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 won a candy. It was an impressive moment to me. Honestly, I was so happy, uh, and um, you know, receiving a, a, a recognition from a an entity like the World Food Forum, that is like you know assessed by strong scientists is gives me credibility at, at the top you know credibility to my research and i want to say also throughout that year maybe i received a lot of media coverage that helped me also throughout my career and increased my voice you know and uh, put extra spotlight on my research so it, it, it's amazing i would encourage every young scientist to to be engaged in this challenge if you win, this is amazing. If you don't win, you will interact with a lot of people who, who will give you motivation, you know, to continue and to do more. And you will learn throughout this journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I remember. I think we all remember your reaction. It was <laughs> like a kid in Christmas morning. You were so happy. <laughs> And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing this. I think besides that, uh, you also received mentorship with, uh, from uh, one of the mentors of the World Food Forum. We worked here in FAO, but others were in other organizations. So I think this, is, this was also uh, useful, sure. right? To, exactly. to grow your network. The learning process was amazing, true. Amazing, thank you so much. Okay, so I now have a question for Paige. Uh, Paige, and, and apologize, we, we decided not to use doctor titles here just to be a bit more informal. So uh, Paige, how can research support the reduction of inequalities? So this can be between urban and rural areas, between the rich and the poor, men and women. So all of these inequalities and promote inclusive economic growth. Yes, thank you for the question. So. In my research, I study rural urban inequalities. And I think the first thing is recognizing that social processes happen in different ways and based on the context. So, you know, in rural areas and in poor countries, there generally is a lack of um, capacity or resources available and understanding alternative models, um, you know, or possibilities for those places and not trying to apply, you know, an urban and a uh, rich country model to these areas um, and you know, kind of imposing those logics on those places is important. So understanding the context of place and how that interacts with opportunities is really important. And then I would say in terms of the role of research and understanding how to create opportunities and inclusive growth, uh, you know, the role of researchers I think is to not only study the problems, but also study the solutions. And so looking for, you know, models of places that have been successful in creating opportunities or inclusive growth is really the first step. So finding places, looking for how they did things, and then trying to see if it would be applicable in other contexts, I think is really, um, you know, the role of researchers. So thank you. Thank you, Paige, and that, that's really why we're encouraged you to help us find those solutions that are relevant to your communities, to your country. I know here between the, the guests, the attendees, we have Alexandra from Biomio. They are a startup. They are finding amazing solutions to do exactly just that here in Colombia. So uh, just finding a way to reduce those inequalities in all areas and empower, uh, you know, uh, the food producers and getting their new products out there here in the market. So this is exactly what we want with uh, the World Food Forum. Thank you, Paige, uh, for this answer. Okay, so now a uh, question for Bruno. Bruno, how can we ensure that the way we produce food is more economically viable and is also more environmentally sound and socially just? So I know it's a loaded question, but just from your research. 
Well, you're using now my words against me. Um, well, that's the, um, I think, $1 million answer, right? But um, on top of everything I've just said, you know, in my previous interaction, I would just repeat myself here saying that circularity is important. But again, recircularity is important. Uh, you know, there's no way we're going to make it in a linear economic system that we, it's, it's a matter of only take, use it, and dispose. And that applies to everything in our economy, and especially with uh, ag agriculture and fertilizers. Um, there's no way we're going to keep forever just mining phosphate rock in Morocco, keep sending it to Brazil, growing a lot of soybeans, and, and that just goes away, and, and then we keep doing it, you know, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Uh, even though we, we know that we have a lot of resources available, they're not infinite. Um, these are really finite resources, so circularity for sure. Um, but before anything, I liked what Paige said uh, about what I like to call it um, purpose driven research, you know, so that we don't really shoot in the dark for all the problems that are out there. And this has a lot to do with my research with modeling, simulation. We really want to be. Uh, efficient at what we're doing. We don't want to go for the uh, scenarios that don't work. So um, I really liked what she said about this kind of purpose-driven research concept. And th this is a wake-up call for researchers as well. It's not just uh, doing research for the sake of research, just because we want to put a paper out there in the literature. We really want to solve problems in the real world. Um, but I think that what will really help is, and this is a major change of uh, mindset, is uh, transitioning into a more um, decentralized food system. Um, now, take the example of the United States that's really uh, uh, clear to see. Uh, you go a lot of you grow a lot of food in California, and you ship thousands of miles away to the East Coast to feed people in the East Coast. Um, and imagine if you know uh, the transportation system is disrupted, right? Why not having food being grown close to where people eat? I know that's not viable for all crops and everything. Um, I think that my video just stopped. <laughs> I know that not, not all crops are suitable for this, but at least we can go for the ones that really work. Um, so decentralized food systems, growing food locally, close to where people eat, so that we can cut inefficiencies. Just like the chief economist said, and a lot of the food is being wasted. Uh, so it's not just a matter of having food available. We have a lot of food available, but a lot of it is just being wasted in the field already, in transportation. And we use a lot of fossil fuel to transport food from California to East Coast and vice versa, or in Brazil and the central Brazil to you know, the urban areas, the more urban areas. So, um, but you know, it, this is not really up to me. You know, um, my, uh, my, my research is like just, you know, this is a really big problem for the big guys in the world, but the idea is out there. Great. Thank you so much, Bruno, for the examples you gave. And I especially like the invitation for purpose-driven research. Again, Paige, as researchers, we always have to keep in our mind why we're doing this. Even if we don't like the results of the first data, why we're doing this research. So yeah, thank you very much. And also for the very concrete examples uh, that we saw during the pandemic, you know, all of the disrupted supply chains. 
but yeah, I, I know we are keeping, we're con being conscious of time. So I'm going to ask a question to Marie. Marie, how can we strive towards the protection, restoration, and promotion of sustainable use of terrestrial and marine ecosystems as a means to com combat climate change? So, so you can give some of the examples, you know, concrete examples that you were mentioning before, because this is a very general <laughs> question, of course. Yes, thank you. No, and um, yeah, I, well, I already talked a bit about how in my own research, I tried to uh, contribute uh, to this uh, big and complex uh, question. Um, but yeah, I think that, that these big and complex questions, but yeah, to solve these issues, we really need um, collaboration. So I think collaboration is, is really key um, because each of us has a bit of expertise or has some experience and together when we put these experiences and expertise together, I think that's where we really um, uh, yes, can make a difference. And I think that's also what is more and more happening in science as well, that we look for collaborations like across disciplines, uh, but also um, scientists um, start to work more together with policymakers or companies and uh, countries among each other are collaborating. So I think, uh, yeah, I guess I want to stress that that's, uh, that I think that is really important in trying to protect biodiversity, natural resources, and also in the face in the face of climate change. Um, and our role as scientists in that um, is, yeah, obviously to um, to study the problems and to study the solutions and generate that knowledge. But I think also we have a, a role to play in communicating uh, those results and being also taking sometimes also a bit of an activist role which well not everyone is comfortable with but I think we're at a stage where uh, that it also becomes very important so also in thinking about then these transforming food systems and the challenge that's ahead uh, of uh, of all the young scientists in the rooms I think yeah collaborating with each other and finding people in your team that uh, have different expertise can really uh, make your uh, research projects or solutions more innovative and effective. Um, amazing, thank you, Marie. And now I see we have some questions from the audience. We're gonna jump on the first one. I see Nafan has volunteered to answer. The question is, how can governments come into the intervention, intervention of zero hunger? More specifically in third world countries where resources are scarce. Mm, yeah. I think I think the work for the government should start with understanding the barriers to achieving zero hunger. You know, I need to understand what kind of barriers I'm facing in my specific context and try tackling these barriers through like collaboration with local scientists, through uh, funding agencies, through local NGOs. For example, in Jordan, uh, if I want an, uh, to give an example, um, yeah, because it, it's one of the third world countries also, uh, achieving, the, yeah, improving water, food security definitely is dependent on water security. And improving water security has many barriers, as I said, which are natural and human driven. I would say, for example, improving water availability for, um, uh, for, for um, agriculture, is facing the barrier of supportive policies, the barrier of uh, access to finance, for example, uh, the barrier also of access to knowledge. You know, so working on resolving these barriers uh, through the ongoing work um, within each country is, is very important. I hope I answered this question. It's a difficult one, but I try to to make it to make the answer from my own experience. So if you have Further questions, feel free. I can answer in typing. No, I think it was perfect. Thank you, Nathan. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask another one and just the first one who wants to answer, go ahead. So this is about your imagination, getting your creative juices flowing. So if you had no restrictions of funding or otherwise, how would you innovate to achieve a world with zero hunger? Come on, don't be shy. Bruno, go ahead. <laughs> well, that that would be the that would be, you know, living the dream. Having no restrictions to funding. Um, 
So in a real situation where let's say someone gives me the credit card with no limit so I can just buy anything I want to test my hypotheses. Um, I think that it is really important to have such a you know, funding program, especially for young researchers, so that we can innovate. We, we, we don't fear the you know, negative results or failures in the project. Um, you know, when you have a very limited budget and a lot of bureaucracy and restrictions involved, you really try to be more conservative. Um, so when there's funding widely available, then we can really shoot for really innovative ideas. Ideas that could really go wrong, but can really go well too. Of course, we're always expecting a positive result from our research. We want to prove that our hypothesis was true, um, but having this, uh, you know, someone telling you in the back, hey, you should do something that's really important, that's gonna change the world. And then you, if you don't, then you fail. Um, and this is not gonna good, look good on your resume. So uh, I think that having this uh, untapped source of funding would help a lot with innovation. Uh, because, um, it, it, you know, innovation, it's what really brings um, transformation. Because otherwise, we'll just keep doing the same. Uh, I, I can't really go crazy about my research uh, and test a very uh, unlikely hypothesis or scenario. Um, so I, I do believe that, that I, 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 having that, kind of access to uh, funding, we could go for more uh, ambitious projects. Thank you, Bruno. And yeah, having no limit of funding is the dream of all of us, of course, <laughs> as researchers. But thank you for your answer. I love what you said that, um, so innovation is needed for transformation. And I, I really wish we had more time for this discussion, but unfortunately time is running. So I would like to invite you all to innovate and help us transform our agri-food systems through the Transformative Research Challenge. So we are curious to know if you already have a research idea, you should be seeing the poll questions on your screen now. And while you start answering and telling us if you already have an idea to participate in the Transformative Research Challenge, we are going to leave you with the concluding remarks of the chief scientist of FAO and after which we will show the results of the poll. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. I cannot be with you in person today, but nevertheless, I wanted to share a few thoughts to set the scene to the scientific roundtable that we need a profound and systemic transformation of our agri-food systems. If we are to provide healthy diets, for the 811 million people who are hungry today and for the additional 2 billion people that the world is estimated to have by 2050. This is why the FAO Youth Committee created the World Food Forum last year. If we want to solve the agri-food system challenges we face today, we must make radical changes. And we are counting on you, young women and young men, to drive this change. The WFF is a powerful movement that aims to empower and harness the ingenuity of young, great minds to be catalyzers of change in agri-food system. We believe that in doing so, we will achieve the Sustainable Development Goal and the 2030 Development Agenda. Since this ambitious movement began, the response from young scientists have been inspiring. Today, the WFF is a major youth platform that fosters and inspires youth-led innovative solutions for many challenges that the agri-food system faces, including a recovery from the pandemic, climate change, natural hazard-induced hazard disaster, conflict, and food loss and waste, to mention only few. 
to tackle them, we cannot rely on business as usual. We need to keep delivering innovative science and based and evidence-based solutions that are both actionable and also sustainable. This is where I believe young scientists and researchers will play a crucial role. Who better than those who will inherit the world to discover the out-of-the-box ideas that we, that we urgently need today? So you might be asking yourself, how can I make a difference? The WFF aims to support, nurture, and scale huge initiatives in science and innovation around the world. This is why we are calling on young thinkers like you to be bold, to brainstorm, and bring your solution to the table. Later this year, the WFF will shed a special light on accessing healthy diets and addressing the climate crisis as a way to transform our agri-food system. And we call on young researchers to help us achieve healthy diets and healthy planets using science and innovation and focusing on the potential of science, technology, and innovation to find those solutions. Science and innovation serve as a foundation for the FAO strategic framework for the next decade, from 22 to 31. And it does cut across all the key dimensions of the strategic framework. We are currently developing FAO first ever science and innovation strategy. And the strategy covers all sectors and areas of agri-food system. We take really agriculture in the broad sense of the word, and that's include crop, livestock, forestry, fisheries, and aquaculture. And it also covers from natural resource management to production, to consumption, to food loss and waste. I invite you to submit your innovative research ideas to the WFF transformative research challenge. This challenge was launched last year in 21 and is an international open call for young and youthful researchers who want to create a better food future and a better future. We are convinced that a sustainable future is only possible when young, men, young, young women are given meaningful and equitable access to opportunities in science and research which is why we especially encourage young female scientists and researchers to participate to this call. We need to bring women at the same level as men when it comes to youth and science and accessibility to research and taking part of it very actively. So that's why we encourage very much young researchers and scientists to contribute and apply for this challenge. The process is very simple. All you need to do is submit your two-page concept note for innovative research to help transform agri-food system by the 1st of June in 2022 on the WFF website. I very much look forward to seeing your ideas at the virtual WFF global stage that's going to be the first week in October 22. To conclude, I would like to remind everyone that our agri-food system are a powerful lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability in herbs. Agri-food system and agriculture at large could be a solution to the climate change, but also a solution to health issues and malnutrition particularly. So let's transform them to create a better future through better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. I agree that the aim is lofty, but one thing is certain, we can't do it without you. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. These were really inspiring remarks and we really encourage women researchers to join and participate and apply to this challenge. Let's see the results of the poll now, because I know we're a bit uh, late on time. Oh, okay. Oh my God. 77% of you already have an idea. Can't wait to read the concept notes. Thank you very much for voting. Um, so we still have some unanswered questions. We will be sharing them in a special article in the next newsletter. So make sure you subscribe. I think our, our team will be sharing the link where you can subscribe. And I would like to really take this opportunity 
to thank all of you uh, researchers, bright researchers that are with us today. So Bruno, Marina, Sam Page, and also our partners, FAO, CGIR, and A5 Alliance. We really miss the chief economy and the, and the chief scientists from FAO. They really wanted to be with us today, but thank you for sending such inspiring words. I would also like to thank the amazing dream team in the back of the, of the, of the, of the Zoom here. We have Nina, the co-lead, Ed, Michelle, Lorenzo, all of the World Food Forum team. Thank you for helping organize these events. And big kudos to all of you for joining today's event. We really had high numbers from the beginning up until the end. It means you found it interesting. And we really invite you to join the official launch of the TRC next uh, 4 of May, next week on the SDI Forum. So thank you very much. And have a great day, great evening, everyone. Thank you.